winter lecture series uh, this year. My name is Michael, for those who've never met me. I serve as the executive director of the Bull Run Mountains Conservancy, uh, which is where you are right now. Uh, this is our headquarters. We do lots of different programs within the building, such as this. Uh, we partner with the White House Farm Foundation and Marie, the Vice President of Operations, who you can see back there. And a lot of our programs that we do that, together that I lead are done over at the preserve. So if you want to get soaking wet tonight, you can come out at six o'clock, meet at the Leopold Preserve parking lot, and we will focus on amphibians. Uh, if you want to hopefully not get soaked next Wednesday, we will be out and you can focus on woodcocks and we'll, we'll do a woodcock watch. Uh, that doesn't involve much of a walk, it's a sit. So if you do decide to sign up for that, or if you're already signed up for it, bring a lawn chair or bring a blanket to sit on because you're pretty much hunkering down to, to watch those birds. So, you know, just to kind of give you a background, the Bull Run Mountains Conservancy was formed in 94. This is actually our 30th year. And we were formed to protect the entire <coughs> Bull Run Mountain Range, which begins down in New Baltimore on 29, goes up to 50 at Aldi. It's about 17, 18 miles long. It's 2.2 miles at its widest, the geologic proper of the mountain. And we focus on five to 10 miles north, south, east, and west. Uh, that's how we first got involved in various projects to the east of this mountain, Silver Lake, which Dave and I were just talking about. Uh, it was a project that we worked on for eight years. If you go to Silver Lake, if you've enjoyed Silver Lake, you can thank the conservancy that there's Silver Lake. It was going to be 12 huge homes, private, part of the Dominion Valley development, the gated, gated community, and uh, through various luck, <laughs> and also a donor who wanted to give us 272 acres if we could save the lake, uh, it was preserved in it to a degree, and there, there is the public, there's 233 acres that you can go to see. Uh, they did have a chance to give us the 233, which would have given us 272, and would have created a 500 acre natural recreation area with mountain biking trails separate from horse trails, separate from hiking trails. The county got to the point of putting us into the property to obtain the land. We got to the point of drawing up so that the land boundaries would be dissolved and it would be in one giant conservation easement with a reverter clause that it would go back to the county if we failed to do what we were supposed to do. And the powers that be did not do it, uh, which is a real shame because uh, whatever would have happened to the Conservancy, you would have had 500 acres to enjoy. It did not happen. The land of the donor is under a conservation easement for a one-family farm. It's not been sold as a one-family farm yet. It probably will be at some point. So you won't ever have public access to that land. But it was conserved. And the 233 of Silver Lake, add to the Scout, the 350, add to Leopold Preserve, and we got to meet Scott Klein, the White House Farm Foundation, and the founder of Leopold Preserve due to our Silver Lake work back in 2008. Now that is 384 acres. So when we started this whole process east, Disney had come in in the 90s. They'd given everybody prices for their land. They're going to do a historical theme park. Everybody got up in arms to stop it. And then they walked away when Disney walked away. And no one thought anything would be done on the eastern side of the mountain. And so when I first started the Silver Lake project with the donor, they looked at us as if we were crazy. It's never going to work. You're never going to be able to do it. It's never going to happen. Well, since then, you have 500. 350 of the scouts, so you're there at 850, 384. So, you know, you're over 1,100 acres that are set aside in permanent conservation at this point. So, it has been very successful. And so, if you want to see part of that scout property, we do a migratory bird walk the first weekend in May uh, with David Weidenfeld. And that's always a great time going around the wetlands. We focus on that. And we've seen, I think, 62 is the most birds we've seen. Uh, in, in one of those walks. So you, you get a good chance to see birds. Okay, so that's us. 
that's how White House Farm Foundation us we got connected years ago. They built it. No one came. Since then, they've sponsored us to do these woodcock watches and the amphibian night hikes and all these programs, which we are love to do. And it's been a great partnership. This is our hike with the naturalist slash winter lecture series because we found less people wanted to go out at this point in the winter. So let's bring it inside and bring someone great like Bill Crisp, who we'll introduce now, to do this uh, Virginia Snake program. Uh, I, Bill's name's been in my database forever. Uh, his daughter came to our camp, her pathology camp, with Marty Martin, the rattlesnake expert mm -hmm. of all the East Coast uh, years ago. And it's great to have him out to share what he's doing. For those who came in late, he does have a survey, uh, a pre-survey before the program, which we can bring this around, I will, when I go back that you can link into, and then he'll have a survey after the program. Uh, for the first time they got here, they get to hold a rattlesnake. Sorry for the rest of you. Uh, yeah. But we, so anyway, uh, we're, we're really glad to have Bill here. And today is a complete, cold-blooded, I like to say, ectothermic terrestrial vertebrate day. So you get to enjoy the reptiles now, and then if you come in the evening, you get to enjoy the amphibians. So we'll tie it all together. All right. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh. Yes. This is Wi-Fi. Anybody, Anybody needs need it? it? Nope. Anybody just got the survey? So just to give you a quick uh, intro on the survey, so we are uh, teaming up with uh, Dr. Christina out of Queensland to do survey on human and snake conflict. So basically, this is the first time we've been running this. If you're interested in participating in the survey, um, we got the QR code back there. We have the Wi-Fi here if you need it. And then after that, you can fill it out while we're talking. But then after the lecture, there's a shorter survey to see how you did during this. Did you come in scared of snakes and you leave scared of snakes? Did you come in scared of snakes and you're fine with snakes? That's the type of research that they're doing. There are questions within that survey that does have personal information. But you do not, you can opt out of not putting that information in. Uh, this is a global survey, so it's not a US, it's all across the world they're doing this for q and So if you're interested, just, uh, I got the post barcodes up here, so once we're done, we can uh, pass these out as well for you guys to. If you're interested in learning more about the research, uh, if you grab a business card of mine, you can send me, shoot me a quick text, I can send you the links to all the data and the team that's working on collecting them. All right, so let's get into, so today we're gonna to talk about Virginia snakes, but we're gonna add in some things um, around, uh, more related to people, uh, homeowners, community members dealing with snakes in their environment. Um, so it's not gonna be just about IDing snakes, but it's gonna be talking about how do we remediate some of this, like glue traps, garden netting, things that's used that shouldn't really be used that is being used now that are destroying wildlife, not just snakes, but uh, other types of wildlife as well. So we're gonna cover a, a bunch of material today and we'll try to cram it in here uh, as close to an hour as we can. And if you have any questions, we'll hang out later and hopefully do the post survey. I have two snakes in the bend here we're gonna take out later. If you are interested, if you're not, I'll give you the cue at the end, that's your signal to exit. And we'll bring the snakes out and you guys can handle those if you choose to do so. All right, so quick intro. Um, I'm a Virginia native, I've been here all my life. I've spent part, part of my life, not living, but I still like that, uh, in the state of North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina, um, where my dad grew up. Um, and the first venomous snake I was ever introduced to, believe it or not, was an Eastern Diamondback, which is not the one you want to start with, especially if you're dealing with venomous snakes. Um, but that was kind of what got me uh, interested in, in snakes in general. I'm a licensed wildlife control operator for the state of Virginia and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We're doing uh, work in the Virgin Islands right now on the island of St. Croix where they have an invasive boa problem that's actually destroying all the native wildlife there. Um, and they were released back in 2010 and now they're all over the islands. So we go down uh, throughout the year and help them uh, dispatch those snakes because it's killing off all the wildlife. It's actually attacking people's pets. Because some of these boas can get up to about eight feet, 
and especially the females, they're very girthy. <coughs> Breeding season's around, they're very hungry and they're looking for their chickens, they'll eat their cats, their dogs, and of course they're more afraid of their kids being impacted by it. Um, so we do a little bit there as well. Uh, I'm also, I do a lot of uh, wildlife uh, caregiving and working with Arrow Rescue. I think I rec recognize someone from Arrow back there as well. Um, I'm also a certified venom snake instructor through EAS, which is uh, Adaptation Environmental Services out of Denver, Colorado. And it's an organization that basically does snake remediation in Denver, uh, working mainly with prairie rattlesnakes and things like that. But what we do is for the venom snake, we go to different states and train folks like, uh, we'll go to uh, army bases, we'll go to uh, businesses and show them how to carefully remove venomous snakes off their property if they're having problems with that and a potentially offensive option to keep snakes, rattlesnakes from entering their property. I've been working with snakes for probably over 25 years or so. I've been into reptiles, specifically turtles and snakes, since I was about seven years old and just never got broke. Um, I'm glad I didn't because I enjoy it very much. Um, I focus on education mainly, intervention, and we're going to talk about that, and then sustainability of our snake population in and around rural Virginia. Uh, my business card is back there on the table if you want to grab one of those on the way out. And we'll get started. Objective today is to provide as much helpful information for you guys as possible. Again, we're not going to get into the scientifics of snakes because we want to we're going to focus, this session is to focus on if you're a homeowner, right, or you have snakes or you're around snakes for some reason on your property, we want to be able to help you get a little bit better, a little bit more comfortable, able to ID it correctly, because we know on social media there's a lot of misinformation around IDing snakes, everything that's brown with a pattern, it's got to be a copperhead, right? So we got to make sure uh, that we can ID it correctly, and that will just help you be more comfortable when you encounter a snake. Now. I'm out hiking, I run into a snake, it startles me too. It happens just naturally, right? So there's nothing wrong with being afraid. We just want to make sure that we're providing the right information for you as we go through the presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about snake intervention just really quickly and why it is not a good reason to use glue traps. Now glue traps are used mainly for in the house purposes. Uh, exterminators will use these, but a lot of folks in this area are now starting to use these outside. Unfortunately, that's not impacting just snakes, but I've had box turtles stuck to them. Uh, we have mammals stuck to them as well, squirrels, birds, etc. And this is just nasty stuff. Um, so what we try to do is encourage people not to use these if they do not have to. Um, and if you are going to use these, because occasionally we will use these to uh, find a baby snake in your house, because finding a baby snake in your house can be quite challenging. Um, but we're monitoring these because these can, these snakes can actually be removed from glue traps within a couple of minutes with just a little bit of veggie oil, right? Veggie oil, olive oil, the spray pan will work too in a pinch. Uh, but again, trying to get people not to use glue traps. We have uh, some northern ringnecks here that were stuck, five of them stuck to that trap. As you can see, this one was stuck upside down, which means the head and the eyeballs are probably stuck to it as well, which is unfortunate. Uh, we have juvenile racer here. The jaw was actually stuck to this, and that snake, every time you made a movement around it, it wanted to bite you. So, of course, it was just doing this, and it couldn't move. Um, I don't know what this contraption is. Someone made this glue, uh, glue trap, but this one had been in someone's home for uh, quite a bit of time. It was deceased. It was, um, but again, these things are so dangerous, and they're now starting to be used outside, which is now starting to impact everything. We're trying to get people to do that um, and stay away from the glue traps as much as possible. We do occasionally do some uh, trainings with exterminators and things like that. We try to encourage them to try to look for other things. There are, I went to a conference back in December in Virginia Beach and it was a pest conference and they had vendors there that were working on some other alternatives than glue traps, which might, may or may not be a better option down the road, but hopefully Garden netting is another one that we experience all the time. Um, this was here in Centerville. This was a, a, a copperhead that was tangled, uh, pretty severely tangled with this. 
and then rat snakes. This one, unfortunately, because folks are using this, this is the perfect time of year because now everybody's starting to get their gardens in shape. Trying to uh, encourage people to use something a little bit firmer, a harder gauge of wire root. So snakes can't get hung up in it. When they get going in that netting, they just keep going. And it just makes it worse. They get tangled up in there. And what will happen in the summertime, they'll sit and bake in the sun. Snakes will dehydrate in a pretty short amount of time. Um, but it's just, again, it's cruel and not a way really to go, right? We were able to free this one. Uh, when we work with venomous snakes with netting or glue traps, it's a two-person exercise, and one securing the head, and the other one working on actually freeing the body. So you never do any of these things. I would not encourage anyone to do this with a copperhead. You can call us, we can come take care of it for you. Um, the rat snakes are notorious for getting caught up in the garden netting. Um, these two were released after we were able to take them out. And you can remove them with just something simple. And I have a little, if anybody's interested, we have a little test here um, and some snips. So we can get these guys out of here, but there is some techniques of getting these out uh, so you're not getting bit, because depending on what species of snake, it's a racer, uh, they're irritated all the time, mostly. Um, a lot of time they're exhausted by the time you get to them, and they don't, all they want is help to get out of it. This one, unfortunately, was a roll of garden netting that was just left on the deck for whatever reason, the snake was cruising around, got tangled up in their steak, uh, sit there and baked and died. So it wasn't really good enough. So again, trying to get people away from blue traps, away from the garden netting. And if you have to use some type of netting, try to use something that has a little bit harder to reach. And this is what the process looks like. So this is um, a rat snake being, uh, I was free in this. This was in Warrington, I think. Once we get this snake undone, out of this netting, We'll inspect it. We'll make sure that it doesn't have any lacerations or cuts or you know defective scales or anything like that. If you do notice something like that, we will take that to a rehabber nine times out of ten. If there's no damage to that, and snakes are pretty hardy and their scales are pretty tough, we will soak the snake then and then release. So this snake, this is it after the fact. So we we do work quite. I get probably forty calls a summer with garden. What are you soaking the snake in? Just, just uh, cool water, not cold, not hot, just enough to give it some dehydration, especially if the snake's been out there for a long period of time in the summer. Um, we just want to get it cooled down a little bit. Um, with, with snakes being cold-blooded, they can't regulate that body temperature, so if they're in the sun and it's 100 degrees, they're going to be 100 degrees, and that's not good for them. All right, mothballs. Again, another one we don't use because they don't work. Uh, this is a copperhead curled up around one right here. <laughs> People put mothballs now outside uh, to get rid of cats or whatever they're trying to do. And mothballs just don't work with snakes. They don't work that way. Um, and plus these are supposed to be used indoors mostly. I think Prince William County is actually illegal to be putting these outside at all. But again, uh, folks will ask about mothballs all the time. It just does not work. We got the snake away, the snake stopper, the whatever repellent lows and Home Depot or Ace Hardware is selling these days. Again, there is no scientific data today that proves that this stuff keeps snakes away from their houses. All right. However, and this is some pelletier, there's a snake girl up right beside it, just saying, hey, it doesn't bother me type of things. But we will see where people will put powder out um, or pellets, and we'll see the snake tracks actually where they have traveled through. Um, so this stuff does not work, no matter how much Lowe's will tell you it does. It, there is no data right now supporting that the stuff does work. Now, since this isn't horrible for the environment and this will make you feel better at night and you can sleep, have at it. It's not gonna do anything, but it's not gonna work. Um, can you read the list of ingredients? Sorry. Which one, right here? Yeah. Um, I can't see it. Excellent. I'm, I'm totally. There it is. I can't um, so with the, the snake pellets and stuff like that, I mean, I, I've told people, if you want to spend the 80, 90 bucks for the bucket of it and you want to put it out, and <coughs> you feel like you had success with it, then that's up to you. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to suggest uh, what we might. However, there are some best practices about keeping, trying to limit 
snakes off your property. You cannot keep snakes off your property 100%. It's not going to happen. Okay? But there are things you can do to limit snakes. Now, snakes come onto the property most of the time because there is probably a food source of some type uh, within the property. And it is found a good place where it has a food source, a place to hide, and it's comfortable. It's going to hang out. Um, mowing your grass and keeping it short, and the reason is because snakes love tall grass. They use it for protection to move from point A to point B. So keep your grass short. Try to limit the watering, obviously, because your grass will grow. That'll create a hiding space for snakes, but it also attracts bugs and insects, which uh, there's a, a percent of snakes in Virginia that only eat insects. So what you're doing is creating a buffet for these guys coming in and you're getting mad at the snake because it is now coming into your property that you're now uh, providing a food source for. Keep trees and landscape stuff trimmed. Um, we have five or six people a year bit by copperheads, either in the hand because they're landscaping and they can't see around uh, their plants, um, or walking outside to take the trash barefooted at night. That's where it mostly comes down to. <laughs> So keeping this landscaping things trimmed so you can see what you're doing while you're outside gardening is a very good idea to ensure that uh, you're not running across them. Baby copperheads, which we're not in copperhead season right now, but as we get towards the end of the summer into mid-August through October, that's where baby season kicks in. All right, so you need to be extra careful around that time frame. And they're super small when they're born. Okay, and they're born live and ready to go. So a lot of people uh, raking leaves and things like that will pick up leaves and encounter copperheads underneath of them. Um, so it's good just to keep your yards clean. Relocate bird feeders away from your house because rat snakes specifically love baby birds and bird eggs. And they will get up into that house um, and that attracts them to your home. So if you have some property, you can move it away. Just move it away from the house so you're not, the snakes aren't up against your house. You can install perching poles. I had a customer one time swore that she had snakes for about five years. She put out perching poles because she had a red tail hawk that hung out all the time. And she didn't have snakes for about two years after that. And she swore it was because of the perching pole because of the hawk. Well, there is truth to that. Those snakes do, or those birds do eat snakes. But I can't really prove that whether or not that even made a difference or not. But some people do. Feeding pets inside. Because you're not feeding your dogs and cats outside, that attracts rodents, right? The food does, which attracts the snakes. We're trying to keep things, snakes away from your house, not bringing them in. Relocating wood pile, brush piles, compost piles, racers, rat snakes love to lay their eggs in compost piles because it's humid, keeps the eggs salt. Um, so get those away from copperheads. Love wood piles, um, stacked slate walls, they like those as well. Hang on in. Think before you landscape, koi ponds, water features, things like that, that attracts snakes, garter snakes, hoggos, etc. Um, because you're attracting frogs, or you have fish, and that's what some of those species eat. So we want to make sure we're limiting that. Seal up cracks and foundation under sidewalks and porches. We get, I probably get 50 or 60 calls a summer for snakes that are underneath steps because they have a hole that where something else is dug into snakes don't think they're in a curve so something else is done the snake's using that to either cool off or it's looking for food so make sure you're sealing up those, these areas around your home and that'll limit the snakes from coming in and, and if you're out on your in property or you're out on your deck and you see a snake up and you want to get rid of it you can use a hose just spray it snakes don't really like that so they'll move on doesn't mean they won't come back but nine times out of ten that will help and then fencing, we're not going to get into because that's super expensive and stuff that we use for uh, commercial building. Can you explain the mulch and the large, large rocks? Why those, why those um, the rocks, if depending on what kind of setup you have, can provide hiding places for snakes. The mulch, we have uh, actually this, this uh, last summer, we had a rat snake that had buried, had basically buried some eggs in somebody's mulch bed. And she had, it was thick mulch. I mean, it, I, she must have had a foot of mulch on there. Because when I was digging, I was like, man, this is, it keeps going. Because normally they just lay it down just to make it look nice. There was a lot in there. That snake had four or five eggs that was in there. So that just kind of keeps them from going there. They do it occasionally. We don't see it a lot, but I always throw it in there just to, to help folks. Um, 
Things do not do. We talked about mothballs. I don't even know why sulfur and acid is even on there, why people would do that. People do put down ceramic eggs outside, thinking that it's uh, an animal egg that's going to scare the snake away. If there's a scent on that, that snake will eat it. It will swallow. We've had a number of snakes taking the Blue Ridge Wildlife to have golf balls, mouse traps, and other things removed uh, that they have swallowed because of that scent. It's not a good idea to do that. We're not going to go out and get king snakes and racers and other predators to release on our property to get rid of the snakes because we get things against the wall to do that. So we don't want to do that. And because relocating snakes in Virginia is technically illegal um, unless you're licensed to do so. Talk about sticky traps. Uh, and then the last thing, we don't want to go out and get our guns or shovels and our weapons to kill that snake. It's just overkill. Okay? But believe it or not, it, it, I've had folks call me, and when I get there, they're standing there with a shovel in their hand over top of this rat snake that's curled up and just looking. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what, what, is, what possesses people to take that and go kill something that's not doing anything? Because they're not educated enough to uh, on snakes and why they're so important to the ecosystem, and they're not going to hurt you. They're not going to hurt you. <coughs> All right. I wanted to put this slide in here because rehabbing is a thing for snakes, believe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. sure. What's the effect if you get bitten by a copperhead? We're going to talk about that in a sec. Yep, I got a whole section where we can talk a little bit about uh, that as well. So rehabbing for snakes is a thing. Um, and the reason why I say this, because I've had people call me before to, that say they saw a snake get hit by a car. Or they said, well, it's probably dead. I'm not going to mess with it. Believe it or not, snakes are very resilient, very hardy. And a lot of times they can be rehabbed, not all of them. This was the worst case that I've ever seen in the last 10 years. We got to the customer's house. The snake had been put in a trash bag after being stomped multiple times. So I guess he put it in the bag, stomped on the snake. It caused a torn uh, jugular vein, a hole in the trachea, one of the eyes was uh, protruding, and then several broken uh, ribs. Um, again, it's illegal to kill snakes in the state of Virginia unless they're causing harm to you. Uh, in this case, this snake had no chance. This is the before picture. And then this is her, we released her um, in this a general area because we keep snakes within a, usually a mile radius of uh, where we, if we can, it's hard around here with all the building. Um, but again, I didn't think the snake would even make it. This is her being worked on um, at Blue Ridge Wildlife. And then she was released about three months later. So they can be rehabbed, it's possible, not just can be. That's a rat snake. These are the Blue Ridge Wildlife and then Arrow Rescue. Arrow is located in Gainesville. For those, if you ever come across any type of wildlife that needs help, Arrow can help with anything, uh, any type of wildlife. Uh, and the Blue Ridge Wildlife uh, might be promoted such as Boys Virginia. Do they work with each other like if, like if there's some issue with, you know, it's in Gainesville, so Blue Ridge calls Arrow and says, hey, we got something yeah. that's still, like, whatever's closest. Then. Yeah, both ways, yeah. So if we have something that Arrow can't do and needs to go to a vet, we'll take the Blue Ridge. If there's something in the area where Arrow can get to first, then they'll do that as well and then assess whether it needs to go to Blue Ridge or not. All right, talk about snakes. So general information really quickly, 3,000 species roughly in the world, 100 species of those in the US, 22 of them being venomous, 34 species in the state of Virginia, three of them that are classified as venomous, uh, snakes are cold-blooded because they can't regulate that body temperature. So we talked about earlier, if they're sitting in a room that's 50 degrees, they're going to be 50 degrees, right? Um, they're made up of vertebrae, muscles, and scales in that order. There's a lot of folks that don't uh, know that snakes have bones uh, because of all the muscles that contain, but they do. I actually have a, uh, a skeleton of an eastern copperhead here. You can take a look at it when, you're, uh, when we're done as well. They have tons of bones, hundreds, depending on the size of the snake. Can you imagine how many bones an anaconda makes have? Right? We're talking thousands of bones. Uh, they do sleep, but what they do is snakes do not hibernate. So right, a lot of snakes uh, right now are coming out of what we call bromation. It's a hybrid of 
hibernation. So they don't sleep technically. Um, they shut their bodies down. Their metabolism drops, they don't eat. Um, they usually start that between uh, late November, December through March, or early March, depending on the weather. Now Virginia, you'll find snakes year around here when we get these warm spells during the winter. Uh, snakes do come out, so they're not completely asleep. They can eat food so uh, items three times the size of the largest part of their body. It's not really good for them, but they can. The rat snake that we have here, that we're going to take out, can consume a large squirrel if they wanted to. Um, so they can uh, eat things that, uh, it's, it's again, not good for them, and we don't feed them things that are super good for them. They can stress out. When snakes eat, they get stressed anyways. Um, imagine trying to swallow something three times your size of your mouth, right? With no arms and hands, so it's a little difficult. Uh, but snakes can also go periods of time without eating. Um, they can go weeks, months. Even some of the African species, just like ball pythons, can go up to nine months to a year without eating anything. They do need exercise because uh, corn snakes specifically um, will gain weight. So if you feed them, overfeed them. For example, if you're feeding them rats all the time, with rats having as much protein and fatty tissues that they have, snakes can develop fatty tissues in the back part of their tail. It's just like us. We gain weight, it's hard to lose it. It takes them forever to lose it, if they even do lose it at all. So we have to really regulate what they're eating and the amount of time. But if you like to travel, this is an awesome pet because they only eat once a week. And you can go on your vacation, forget about them, come back, and they're content. They don't hold it personal. Uh, they do shed their skin. We have some shedding of uh, skin up here if you want to take a look at that. They do shed their skin depending on the age of the snake normally. You know, baby snakes can shed uh, multiple times a month. Normally it's once a month or every other month that they can shed. They use that shedding process as like a healing process, similar to like we have when we fall and we have scabs, right? We'll scab up and it'll peel off. Snakes do that to help repair their body, get rid of parasites. And um, they do not have ears. They can feel you. They have nerve endings in the bottom of their lower jaws that they sense the vibrations that they can pick that up when you're walking towards them. They do lay eggs and have live young. So we have, there's a, I don't know if it's 50%, but around that, uh, species in Virginia that have live young versus eggs. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, let's see, are snakes slimy? No, it's cool to the touch that you'll find out here in just a do they have teeth and can they bite? Yes, uh, they can. Do these snakes bite? They can. They haven't in a while, um, but they can. And we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that as well. And one of the big ones on social media, snakes chasing people. You gotta love all the memes of snakes chasing, especially cottonmouths chasing people or copperheads. Snakes just do not chase folks. They go from point A, point B, and you just simply are in their way, right? Um, so we'll squish that. All right, let's talk about, so we're going to talk about Virginia snakes, but we're not going to talk about all 30. We'll be here all day. We talk about how, how much water do they need when they're hibernating and, and when they're active? Um, when they're usually when they're hibernating, nothing. Um, I don't, for, I have, I have, I have several pet snakes. I don't put them into a hibernation or formation unless you're breeding them. Um, so mine stay active year round, but during that hibernation period, um, they won't eat usually. But if they are out for some reason, we get a few days in say December that's in the 70s, snakes will come out, they'll stay out, they may drink, they may eat. Um, but that's usually working towards the time they're getting ready to go in to kind of hibernate. So it's, it's less than any. Yeah so, when, yeah, so when tongues flip their, their, their tongues, they're basically picking up uh, air particles in the air. And it's basically telling them what that is. That uh, air particles connect to that tongue. The tongue goes back to the Jacob's organ in the back of their mouth. And it registers like a computer to say, this is food, this is a predator, etc. And that's how they use it as sense. Yeah. So when we take these guys out, you'll see, especially the corn snakes, she's working their tongue all the time. She wants to. 
All right, so we're going to go through this uh, pretty quickly because I'm not going to cover all. We're going to cover the ones that I deal with the most in this area. Um, so we have 34 species in the state of Virginia. Three of them are classified as venomous, which means they have fangs and venom glands that they inject venom to eat. That's how they eat. We have the eastern or northern copperhead, depending on the region of Virginia that you're in. We have the timber rattlesnake, and then we have the northern cottonmouth that is not in this area, but we're going to talk about that as well. So we're going to start with the eastern rat snake. So IDing these guys, what's tricky and what we get a lot of calls about are folks will see these in the spring usually, or in the fall, and thinking that these two snakes are two different species of snakes. They're actually the same species. They're born with a pattern for camouflage purposes. And about after the first year or so, roughly, they start losing this pattern and turning into more of a black snake. Now, some of these snakes will keep Rex that we have here. He's about 14 years old, and he has some of his patterns still. You can still see it a little bit. And then there's some that are jet black. This one actually has no eyeball. But again, these are located all over the state of Virginia. They are the longest stake that we have in the state. Um, and probably the most commonly seen. Uh, this is the one that people call the common black snake. Um, but they basically, this is the one you're gonna see all the time. The juveniles, after a year or so into this phase here, rodents, lizards, frogs, bird, bird eggs, etc. These guys aren't truly picky about what they're eating but they do also lay uh, eggs as well. So after IDing there, I always say that uh, Eastern rat snakes or rat snakes have a glossy paint job, right? It's glossy, shiny, iridescent occasionally. If the sun hits it correctly, compared to its, its buddy, the Northern Black Racer, that actually looks sort of like it. They're very long black snakes. They both are born with a pattern and then they uh, eventually lose it. I don't see a lot of racers that have patterns left once they mature, but nor racers have these wicked long tails, skinny tails, and they keep that for, most, uh, for all of their life. These guys are not the longest, but they are the fastest, they are quick. Uh, a lot of times when we have calls with these guys in folks in homes or in their yard, I will always ask them, is it shiny or dull? Because if it's dull, I probably won't get there in time to save your yard, most likely. <laughs> If you approach this snake or it sees movement, it does not stick around. It's gone. Well, it's nothing to do with you. If you corner it, it will turn, strike, and defend itself like most snakes do. But as you can see with this guy, their uh, diet is pretty much anything. They don't really care. They're not picky. They prefer smaller food items versus would you ever see a, a race, large racer eating a squirrel? Probably not. This guy wants to eat it as quick as he can so that he can turn and, and, and defend itself. That's what they do or get away with. They also are egg layers. And then here's a comparison, as you can see, shiny, glossy compared to a more of a matte black. The scales are a little bit bigger. These guys have huge eyeballs, um, dark enough to where you can't even see the, the pupil of the snake where the rat snake has a lot smaller eye. And then the rounded here, it looks more like a mamba. You ever guys seen that? The uh, animal planet? The black mamba or the green mamba? They have, I call it the Virginia mamba because it acts like it sometimes. It has that rounded snout, where this one has more of a pointed snout. Again, we talk about food sources. Much larger will, most of the time, could eat larger food sources, where this one wants something quick and sweet. And then, of course, the, the fence part is in the main race away. This one will turn, defend itself. They both will do it if they are cornered. But again, a bite from these guys is, is very annoying. And they are not numbers. So we talk about, we get folks that call all the time to say, we have a black snake in my yard. Well, we gotta narrow it down a little bit because we have quite a few black snakes in color in, in this area. Uh, we covered the Eastern rat, a rat snake, Northern black racer. The garter snake is one that uh, is also pretty common, and you'll see it all the time. Uh, this is a darker, blacker phase. They do come in like an olive, uh, lighter yellow or olive color sometimes. Um, so we have this one. The unique part, we'll talk about the garter snake in just a second. Then we have our uh, Eastern hog, which is one of my favorites. 
I don't know, have you, anybody ever encountered a hog nose? I was sur I bio surveyed those down south. Okay. The yeah. Peninsula. They are the coolest <laughs> snakes to mess with. Yeah. Uh, because they are, um, if they were taking theater and class, it's an A plus plus plus. <laughs> and the reason is, is they've got so many defense mechanisms, it's just hilarious to watch them. And I cannot pass one without messing with them. Now, you're not going to see these guys a lot, um, but they have the tendency, uh, if they are messed with, and it's for you know, protection, is they will hiss, and it's very loud, it's a very obnoxious hiss. And if that doesn't work, they're going to flatten their head like it is doing right now. It's going to pretend it's a cobra and kind of raise its head up a little bit. Why it's still hissing? Because it still doesn't want to be messed with it. If that doesn't work, it's going to basically false bite. It's going to just launch its face, never opening its mouth, and just tag you with its face. Okay, while it's hissing, and probably while the hood is still flat because it still wants to collect all these these uh, uh, defenses. And if that doesn't work, it's finally going to say, "Okay, I'm going to." The, the, the finale is, I'm going to flip over on my back. I'm going to play dead. I'm going to stick my tongue out of my mouth, and I'm going to release a scent out of my anal gland that's going to smell like a dead animal, and it will lay there and play dead. If you flip that snake back over, it'll flip right back over. <laughs> and it will lay there for a long period of time. So if a fox comes along, right, or a coyote, and they, uh, they'll do that as a defense. They smell that nasty smell and they move on. The snake flips over and goes on about its business. So it's very dramatic. Very dramatic. And then we have the king of all snakes in Virginia. It's our eastern king uh, that we have here. And that snake is the king snake because of why? They eat other snakes. That's their primary diet, but they do eat, um, you know, other things like uh, skinks and, and and birds and things like that as well. Okay. So when, when a customer calls, we have to narrow it down a little bit because, like I said, if this is a racer that you're dealing with, I may not get there in time. So I want to make sure we have uh, the right identification for these. Garter snakes have this checkered pattern. Right here, hog nose, they do come in a variety of colors, not just black. And we'll show you a picture of one of those. King snakes got the stripes. They keep, they're born like that. They look like that as babies. They look like that as adults as well. Here's your garter snake. So they have the olive. This is one of the most uh, brightest yellow garter snakes that I've ever found. Um, but these guys love toads. Uh, their diet starts to change with these snakes here. So they love um, toads, amphibians, frogs, um, minnows. They pretty much eat anything um, that's small enough that they can fit in their mouth. Um, these guys do have uh, three different sets of teeth for different jobs. Curved teeth for holding prey in. <clears throat> but what they have in the back of their mouth are basically uh, bones or teeth, like a, like a fang. That's not the same as a cockroach. And what that does basically is when that frog puffs itself up to say, you're not eating me, that garter says, yes, I am, takes those teeth and pops that frog and then it's just consumed. So they, a lot of times, if you were to get bit by this snake, uh, that toxin that they have in their mouth can cause a irritation itch or sometimes some swelling, but it's not harmful for us. We're not good sign. With any bite of any animal, make sure you're white, you know, washing your hands, etc. if you happen to pick one. But you can enjoy it. So, the, the light area in the range is not there? What, what's the light um, area? Um, so the areas that are white, they were not there when surveyed, uh, but they're probably there. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see that break off and reduce as we get to some of the species, you'll start seeing it really back off a bit. But a lot of these species, though, at least the first three we've talked about, are pretty much located in and around Virginia general. Then we have another one. This one is the decays brown. This is the one that uh, is confused with the copperhead. The reason is because it's brown. It has a pattern on its back, so it's got to be a copperhead. Right? But these are very super small snakes. This was uh, the one I was told. This is an adult. But these snakes are super good for your gardens and, and your yards because they eat all the insects you don't want there. Uh, they do have a lot of young, uh, but you can identify them as they're usually this dark brown with a little bit of a pattern on the top. Uh, but as you can see now, it starts to drop off a little bit more in the range. But a super small snake, you know, around 12 inches or so, maybe a little bit more. 
Now they do compare pretty close to the garter snake. Um, but again, I, I don't see a lot of decays that have this, I mean, this snake was kind of gold color. It was one of the, I've never seen one like this. That's why I did these comparisons. But they do kind of have the same little pattern. But again, this one has that dorsal straight all the way from the head down to the tail. Then we have the Eastern Worm Snake, super small snake. You've probably seen these. They're at the, I've seen them all over the massive battlefield. Uh, you probably thought it was a night crawler, but it is in fact a snake. Um, these guys are also found in the gardens and things like that. Uh, but these guys are starting to eat more of the, the you know the smaller slugs and things like that. Northern water snake. This is another one that's always confused by either cotton uh, cottonmouth or water moccasin, whatever folks call it, or copperhead, just because they're the dark color of the pattern on the back. Um, and we're going to show a comparison slide here in just a minute. These snakes are very heavy bodied snakes. Uh, they do get pretty big, but their diet consists of mainly fish and amphibians. So they'll eat catfish, crappy, bluegill, etc. And a lot of times you'll see them if it's near water. They'll, they'll be, this one was at the Prince William Park, uh, curled up on a leaf litter basin right next to the river. And then we have our northern ringnecks, obviously. Whoop, sorry. Or the ringnecks um, identified by the ring around their neck are born with that. Uh, that can vary in color depending on where you are in Virginia. Some of the southern states have it orange or even like a yellow type of color. This was taken right here on Boron Mountain about four years ago. Um, but again, these, as we're starting to see, most of these snakes are a lot smaller, right? Uh, but can be easy identified. They do have rear, we do have smaller snakes with rear fang, uh, but that is to help consume insects and things like that. These guys are, uh, this is what we found, saw on that sticky trap at the beginning of the presentation. Eastern smooth earth snake, we see these again, but super small, right? as they get. But again, brown or silver in color. This is our another king snakes, our northern mole. Uh, this is another snake that has a very pretty pattern when they're young. Burgundy, really bright burgundy saddles. And they still keep it as adults, but it's it's faded pretty much. But that's another species of, that came here. These are found quite a bit. I get more calls probably for these than I do the Eastern King. And that's our Eastern King snake consuming our snake here. But they've been known to, you know, eat chicken. They'll eat uh, small chicks. Um, they, we've even had customers uh, that have called to say they had, you know, kittens and it consumed kittens. Uh, but they will, you know, they're pretty aggressive eaters. Uh, I have a Florida king at my house, and he knows when it's feeding time. It's, he'll ignore you the entire time you're down there, but once he smells, senses, he's all up against that glass ready to eat. So they. But these guys have the stripes, and these are not common. You don't see these. You have to really look for these snakes, hog nose, corn snakes. They're not just readily available when you're hiking. You have to really look for them. I've, I've lived in Virginia all my life. I've seen four corn snakes in the wild, um, and that's because I was looking for them. King snakes, kind of the same. We do get these more in Woodbr the Woodbridge area, and we do get calls. And then just a summary of the top kind of 10 non-venomous that I've covered just now. Why do you get more in the wood bridge? It seems like that's a lower venture. We do, we, you know, it's funny because when we talk about copperheads, we get more, we, last summer we got, uh, we removed 104 copperheads from Northern Virginia and relocated out of, out of residential areas. A lot of them were older uh, Manassas areas, Woodbridge, and Gainesville. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but again, these are just a corn snake, which we have here today. Um, we got our Eastern Milks we're gonna talk about. You'll you'll see these guys occasionally too. They love being up in the trees. Here's our hog nose that's plain dead. Look at its tongue sticking out. <laughs> they also come in this color here, you know, the orange and the blacks. They were a common ribbon, and a queen, a red belly, and our Northern Scarlet, some of the favorites. 
the pattern. And then we have our southern wind next to it. So these are all kind of in the area, but we don't um, we don't get a lot of calls for these. Any questions on non boom We're gonna talk about those. Uh, that's where we close the questions for. All right, better mistakes. We talked again, we have three of them. We're gonna focus mainly on the cop rev because that's the one we get calls for the most. Um, and what we deal with uh, the most throughout the season. Um, so one of the things that I want to do with copperheads is make sure venomous snakes in general is just kind of squash some of the uh, nonsense that's out there on social media around identifying a venomous snake or telling the difference between the two. And this is a, a one that comes up all the time is identifying a venomous snake based on the head shape. Anybody sees these snakes online, they look triangular, they, they must be venomous. And in fact, the truth is, Non-venomous snakes here, like this eastern rat, this juvenile, can flare its head to look venomous as one of its defenses. So if you were to take away these pictures here, could you tell the difference between the copperhead and the rat snake? No. So identifying a snake or telling, oh, that's definitely you know, venomous versus not, is not a good idea. You gotta know the patterns, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so head shape's not a good idea. The pupil, where people say, if it's a slit pupil, it is venomous. Copperheads, in this case, can dilate their pupils uh, all the time uh, to look like that. So again, knowing the patterns, and if you're this close to see that slit pupil, <laughs> probably not a good idea, right? So they can dilate. So again, not a good idea to do that. And in fact, we do have a species of snakes on the East Coast that does have round pupils, but it's highly toxic. So don't want to go by that. We got to know the patterns when we're IDing these snakes versus uh, just the isolator, just the head shape. Venom versus poison. This comes up quite a bit too. Venom is something that is entered into the bloodstream versus, you know, via needle, fang, syringe, etc. Or poison is more something that's ingested. I wouldn't suggest eating any of our frogs in this area like, or anything like that. Uh, but if you can inhale it, it's poisonous. We see poisonous snake all the time uh, on social media. And even though it's not that big of a deal, people will say, well, it's a big deal. I mean, get the terminology right. So when you're talking about something, you're not confusing everybody else that you're talking about, and then they're getting it wrong. And that's kind of how it spirals out. Here. <coughs> and this is not a skeleton head of anything in Virginia. <laughs> So you don't have to worry about something that big. <laughs> um, and I put this in here because venom is used for a lot of medical purposes that people just don't realize. And when I do this, a lot of times people are, I didn't know that was something that's being worked toward diabetes, breast cancer they're using, uh, copyright venom right now for. Um, and there's some other research projects that are going on. Um, that my, one of my friends is working on at Denver, and they do use that for a lot of these medical All right, Eastern Copperhead is one of our three venomous snakes in the state of Virginia. And how do you know it's a copperhead? Well, by my favorite candy, of course, the Hershey's Kisses. This is the pattern that these copperheads have. There's no other snake in Virginia that has this type of pattern. Now there's some that are close and they look pretty uh, close to a copperhead. But again, knowing that this is uh, shaped like a Hershey Kiss, you can call it a flame, a volcano, whatever you want, but they have these, uh, you know these patterns just like a Hershey kiss. Now this is a, uh, a baby copperhead and the reason why you can tell that is by the yellow or lime green tail. When they're born, they're born with that bright tail. So if you see a snake in Virginia that has that, just don't touch it. Um, these guys and the, the cottonmouth both are born with a yellow tail. They drop it usually probably after the first 8 to 12, 14 months or so. It varies. Uh, but eventually it'll just fade to a, a darker tail. Um, again, um, baby season, mid-August to early October. That's when you want to not go out barefooted, uh, take your trash or walk your dog, um, and make sure if you're landscaping, uh, you know, not always stick your hands. These guys are pit vipers, and they are born with, uh, obviously, the diluted pupil, but the pit, uh, the nostril, and then a heat-seeking pit there that they use for uh, hunting.
copper heads are also the camouflage. As you can see in this one, this is right next to a, uh, a, a platform with a trail bridge, basically. So if you were to step off of that, you probably couldn't see that, right? Um, these are the fangs. So these vipers have basically two fangs that fold up in the uh, top part of the mouth. They're connected to a venom gland that when they do bite something, they deliver venom. They can regulate what they're given because they rely on that venom to eat. They have, they don't have uh, the ability to, to get constrict like a rat snake does. So what they'll do is they'll bite their prey, let it go, the prey will wander off, it'll die. And then they can pick that up. There's a, um, as part of the tracking mechanism, is that venom that they can sense, right? And they can find that animal wherever it's deceased. As I was saying, the size of them are very small. That's the size of, that's a quarter right there. But here's your uh, yellow tail. But again, there's your Hershey Kisses or your gold candy. These guys are born live and ready to go. So they are venom day one. Um, they're born in an embryo sac, basically not an egg. Um, and then once they come out, take their first breath, they're ready to go. There you go. All right, we have three copperheads in this picture. Can you find them? And hopefully you're not taking this trail. That'd be a bad day. Okay, we've got one here. We've got one going this way. We have another one going this way. So these are three that we removed from uh, our customer yards. We took out in the woods, put them in the leaves. We wanted to take a picture so folks could see how well they went. And that's why there's three together. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's why there's three together. Tell me where the trail is again. <laughs> no, this was not on a trail. This was far away from any trail, so no one's injured. But yeah. Okay, some copperhead FAQs. Um, are baby copperheads more dangerous than adults? Unfortunately, that is not a yes or no question. Right? I tell people all the time it depends on the situation. So uh, imagine, from a venom perspective, imagine, uh, so this is a baby compared to an adult. Um, an adult copperhead will have a venom gland maybe the size of like a lima bean, something similar to that. These babies are very small, maybe a pencil eraser, smaller than that. So from a venom perspective of what it can deliver, what do you think is more dangerous? The adult or the baby? The larger one. The larger one. So there's a myth, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there on the internet about babies being more venomous or more dangerous. They are more dangerous than the adults because of how small they are. You can't see these babies when you're landscaping or working in your garden. You happen to put your hand down there and pick something up and you feel this sting, then that's what the babies are more dangerous for. So from a venom perspective, they're not as, as dangerous as the adults, but from a size perspective, it's pretty scary to be able to, to, to reach down and pick some up. You would never even know it was there. I had a lady one time, she was raking in leaves. She raked it into a pile. She went inside to eat or something. She came back out. She went to go bend down to pick up her leaf pile to put it, and she stopped, didn't, Rape the pile, and there was two baby copperheads in the pile. We have to be very careful with these guys because they are very tiny. So that's kind of the the that's what I use as an example. They're not um, it's not a yes or no, but obviously more venom um, is not good. Uh, do baby copperheads have the same? They do have the same type of proteins in the venom. Um, you know, some data shows that um, younger copperheads, baby copperheads, they have. Um, their, their venom, even though it's the same, it works quicker. So um, just think of something the size of a pencil, right? Bite something, and then that thing gets away. That snake would never find it if it got too far away, right? So the venom actually reacts a little bit quicker for that, and as they mature, the proteins change. But it's basically the same hemotoxic venom that uh, the adults have. It's just you're getting less. Uh, if bit by a copper, should you seek medical attention? Yes, absolutely. Um, they're not life-threatening, but I will tell you there are folks, uh, like I said, we have five or six, seven folks that were bit last year, two in the ankle, the rest were in the hand. Uh, one guy 
decided he wasn't going to go to the hospital. He was ex-military, thought he was too cool. He ended up in intensive care two days later. You don't know how the venom is going to react to, your, to you. You may have a condition that you're not aware of where something reacts, and it could work differently uh, than that. Some folks uh, will get bit. They'll go get some antivenom, and they're on their way. Some people are in a hospital for several weeks. So it, it, it really depends on how much you get and if you have any medical conditions that affect it. The baby coppers control the amount they can, but they don't have a lot uh, to give. And remember, these snakes depend on this venom to eat. If they don't have venom, they can't eat. They're going to starve. So they can regulate it. But with a baby copper, you're not getting very much uh, venom. The venom gland is just not that big enough. How do you know there was a copper in that bit you, not something else, and that it's uh, venomous? Um, a lot of times, you well, from a copper bite, you're going to get like a stinging, like a stinging sensation. Or it, it's usually too... Uh, two holes where they have bit. It doesn't happen all the time because snakes will, venomous snakes will lose fangs, and sometimes they only have the one until the other one grow, uh, fills that place. But if you get bit by something like that, you're going to feel within you know a few minutes. You're going to start feeling probably a little burning. You're going to feel maybe a little nauseous. Um, at that point, uh, most people you know can look at their hand. They'll maybe a little bit of blood, but it's usually just the two prongs. Um, and then that's just an indication to get to the hospital. Because at that point it can accelerate depending on who you are or what condition you have. It can go right from, this is stinging and burning my hand to, I am now feel like I'm gonna pass out. What's, what's your It's, and the doctors didn't believe her. Yeah, I mean, it's and didn't, possible. didn't treat her as such, and she was pleading with yeah. them, and she ended up in a wheelchair like four days later. Her venom was just slowly. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about, like, often? I I have not <laughs> done that, uh, but I do know it's possible. I mean, like I said, they do drop things, um, and normally another one grows back pretty, you know, quickly, but it's, um, I've never, I have not seen a bite myself. It's just had one thing. Were you asking about if there were a non-venomous snake that bit you? Like, how would you know? Well, the reaction would tell you, I guess, and the other two venomous snakes are rare, and then you say it's probably a copperhead. Yeah, well, I mean, with the other venomous, um, you're getting a lot more venom from, like, a cottonmouth or a timber because they just have bigger glands. Um, but, for co yeah, for copperheads, people do get bit hiking and may not realize it. Um and they, you know, later they now start feeling the symptoms and they stop and they end up finding there's two, two fang marks. But again, it depends. It may be just the one that got through the sock and the other one didn't. Uh, you know, and that could happen too. So I, I was bit by a copperhead mm -hmm. and I definitely felt the, when it hit. Yeah. Um, but I, nev I never felt, I never felt nauseous. Okay. Um, so if you have, um, and we have to do it today, but if you have time and you're okay with it, I'd like to talk to you about it. Because I do go out, for the folks that were bit last year, I went out and did just a quick interview with them. I want, I'm trying to get as much feedback on folks, uh, their bites, their experiences, and I, what I'm finding is there's a, each experience is a little bit different. Some people are, are not getting sick. Um, some are immediately having to go to the hospital because they're not able to breathe, which it doesn't really affect your respiratory, but it, if you have another condition that that venom is affecting, it could. So it's been different. So I'd like to, I'll give you one of my cards and you can maybe connect, if you don't mind. I, oh, no, you, yeah, fine. just to do a little But they, they can do dry bites. Yeah, they can do dry bites. They, I mean, they can bite you and you're fine. But again, just go get checked just in case. You just never. Oh, I mean, I had a reaction, but it wasn't immediate yes. when, you, when you said, you know, it, it, it could be, or it, yeah, the, I, the gentleman last summer was bit in the foot, and he immediately went and put ice on it, which you shouldn't do. But he hung out, I mean, he was there for probably a few hours before he started feeling it. He was going to wait to see if anything, if he actually got envenomated. 
And I'm like, that's not a good idea, but at that point, it, it was four hours past that I had, you know, had gotten to him. And then he started feeling the effects later that evening. And then went to the hospital. So it does affect people differently. And why don't you want ice? Ice can irritate or can irritate the bite. And we're going to talk about it a bit, which you can do and don't do type of thing. So we'll get to that in just one second. Uh, let's see, copperheads, bites, uh, if they're recently killed, yes. If you pick, if, if this fang comes in contact with your skin, it can still eliminate you. There is a possibility. Um, so if you see something like this, don't pick it up with your hand because you don't know if it's if it's completely dead or not. Um, use a stick or use something uh, to do that a little bit. The copperheads breed with non non venomous snakes. My grandma used to tell me that copperheads and rat snakes were breeding, and there's this wicked hybrid out there. <laughs> <laughs> if she's still alive, I'd tell her that's not true. Uh, but they don't. But they do den uh, with other snakes. I mean, even though um, the corn snakes and rat snakes sometimes will eat copperheads occasionally, they do den with them in the winter. Uh, copperheads and timber rattlesnakes <coughs> then together as well. So um, they're not breeding. They're just using each other's space. And then do, do copperheads distribute venom every time? No. There's defensive bites, which could be just the pokes and you just stepped on me, or the prey seeking bites because it knows that it's going to be something to eat. That snake knows I'm too big for it to be consumed. It's probably not going to get me. I always put this out. This is old too. This is 2015, but you're. It's way more than that. Hopefully, your insurance is a little bit better than some of these other folks that we've encountered as well. Just really quickly, hemotoxic venom is what we have for all of our actually venomous snakes, and that can change depending on the region um, that they're located in, uh, based on the prey that they eat or feed on. Um, again, we talked about can cause extreme pain, tingling, throbbing, swelling. Uh, you feel sick, etc. Um, copperheads in general, you know, one bite max about 85 grams of venom. Uh, anywhere between 80 and 100 can kill a person, but th that snake is not going to give you all that. Um, they know how to regulate that venom so they can have more to uh, be able to eat. Uh, the one thing is around smaller, younger kids, elderly kids with conditions are more at risk if they're bitten by any really any venomous uh, snake. Um, dogs as well. Dogs have to stick their face and everything. Um, we've had we had ten dogs this past summer that were bit in the face um, by copperheads. Well, that happens all the time. How does that how does that work if the dog is bitten? Do they do they like go to the vet and they yeah. or do they die or no they not I have not heard of any dog fatalities from copperhead bites. Uh, but it is a vet visit, definitely. And I'm sure it's miserable. I can only imagine their face just swells up and it just looks miserable. Um, but if you do end up, for some reason, hopefully your insurance is a little bit better. A lady in Montgomery County back, um, it was back in like 2012, got bit. She was out back around her pool. She picked up a copyright and bit her in the finger. Bit her twice, actually. She ended up going to the hospital. She had... Normally, when you go, um, at least cases that we have um, talked to folks about, you're getting probably four vials of antivenom, roughly. They're very expensive, ten or $12,000 a piece. She walked out of the hospital with like over $200,000 of a bill. Her insurance covered like 10%. So I think insurance might be a little bit better these days, but I don't know. It depends on what you got. Just don't pick anything up. Just be careful with your stuff. All right, mimics. So again, when we look at the difference between a copperhead, this looks nothing like these guys. So people say, I know that is a copperhead because it's got this pattern on it, but we're talking black and brown. Now this is an above shot where you can see that Hershey Kiss turns into like an hourglass. Um, I wouldn't tell you, I wouldn't suggest standing above a copperhead like this to get a picture. But again, it just uh, it goes to show you the difference between the brown tan and the black. There's no way to miss ID these snakes. Okay. This gets a little closer. They're Eastern milk. We didn't talk about that, but again, another um, species that we have here. 
And then our juvenile, our younger northern water snakes, they look, oh, I mean, close. It's closer. I always say these guys look like Martian heads or smokestacks. Or there's actually a picture right next to you on the northern water snake versus the copperhead. Um, but again, it's it's getting closer, right? The colors are getting a little bit closer. So if you were to walk up on the snake in, in the wild, could you tell it uh, the difference? And then we really get close. And then we have our corn snake compared to our copperhead, which is really close. Again, Hershey kiss pattern compared, uh, compared to what we call saddles. Those specs here. Okay. All right, that's copperheads. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on tempers because we don't see them a lot, although this picture was taken here in Boulder Mountain two, year, two years ago, I think. Um, so again, the second venomous snake that we have uh, in the state of Virginia is our tender rattlesnake. I love rattlesnakes. Um, this is one that we're using for training uh, purposes here. But as you can see, their colors are a little, they can be an olive brown, they can be all black. They can have the, the mix of white and black here. But again, rattlesnake comes from what? Because of the tail. These are basically beads that every time that snake sheds its skin, it creates another bead. Okay. Now, can you tell the age from a rattlesnake by the length or the size of the tail? <coughs> no, because these rattles can break off. Um, and you, I've seen adult copper, uh, adult timbers with just maybe the nub or one uh, bead on that again. Again, same type of venom. You're getting a lot more, most likely, when you. Their venom glands are a lot bigger than a copperhead. Um, but their venom also can vary depending on if you start getting more west. Um, West, depending on the prey that they're preying on, uh, the proteins can change a little bit to where it's reacting a little bit uh, different. Again, these are big bodied snakes, very secluded snakes. Um, you're not going to just, I mean, you will see them. Shenandoah during COVID, it was every day someone was hiking during, uh, say, in late June to like August time, was texting pictures of them hiking in Shenandoah. They were seeing them on the main trails with all the traffic. Um, and it's probably just because more people were out seeing them. But again, a lot of times these guys are staying kind of up in the higher elevations and they're not really around people. We did remove two from, um, was it part of Fauquier County last year? We did remove two timbers and just basically took them back up um, away from anyone. But pretty cool snakes. Um, they will let you know a lot of times before they, you know, do anything because of that rattle. But not all the time. And then the final one is our cottonmouth, which we do not have in this area, which is confused a lot of times with that northern water snake that we talked about just earlier. But this one does have their uh, the little tail, the lime green or yellow tail here. They're called cottonmouths because of when they open up their mouth, it looks like a it's just solid white. That's their their gaping. They're basically telling you, stay away from me, or I will bite you. Um, Again, another one we were using for training. And these guys, um, again, in a very selective part. There are starting, we are starting to see them uh, branching out a little bit this way as well. Um, but for the most part, that's where they're at. So if you're spending time down in Virginia Beach and down that way, you could come across one of these. Here's a kind of a comparison shot, a really an ID. So we've got our northern water snake that we just talked about. In our cotton mouth, you tell the difference between the face, where the water snake has these vertical lines, cotton mouth does not. They have this horizontal kind of stripe or mask uh, across that piece. Both very heavy bodied snakes. Uh, one of the things that you can ID uh, that'll help you ID these snakes from a distance is when these guys swim, majority of the time they swim fully submerged, coming up from here occasionally. These guys will actually puff themselves up and they'll float. And they'll ride their, you know, rapid stuff. I've seen them in Shannon, or, uh, down in uh, Virginia Beach do that. And they'll actually just sit on top and then they'll put their head up and they'll swim like this. So a lot of times you can tell um, these two apart if, unless you're down in the swamps. I mean, I don't know if you'll ever run into one of these. You might see them in a zoo. Is that a misconception that like a lot of people think, well, if it skims the water, then it's venomous, but can't other snakes? All snakes can swim. They can swim, but yeah. 
because the ones that are skin in the water, that's when people get freaked out because they're like, well, it's always a venomous snake and it's yeah. skins. Yeah, like, well, water snakes can do it too. Um, so it's a, mis it's yeah. a misconception. Yeah. Like, I hear a lot of people think that that's kind of a hard and fast fact. And well, for the last like five years, we've had um, people tell us there's cotton mouths in Fairfax. Yeah. And I say, send me a picture. I want right. to. I, I would love to know if that's the case because I, I like. They're okay to work with. They're stinky and they just, <laughs> you know, they're messy. But um, send me a picture. I've not received one picture. And mm -hmm. if that's the case, great. But um, you're seeing what you're seeing is this here because it does look pretty close. But that's what we're we're finding, at least in the last say twenty five plus. Years. All right, venomous snake bite information. Don't buy this stupid thing. <laughs> Another waste right there. This is located right next to the um, sticky traps. The sticky traps <laughs> and the uh, snake stopper. Right? Eight thousand people bitten a year uh, or so in the U.S. around uh, venomous snake. You have a better chance of dying from aspirin than dying from snake bite. Now again, that depends on where you are, uh, but in Virginia, that, that's the case. Um, Let's talk about what we do if we, what we do not do if we are ever um, but We do not become overexerted because all that's doing is it's making you know the venom and your bloodstream pumping harder. So we want to keep you calm as much as possible because um, people, you know, you freak out. You just got bit by a snake. You're scared. You don't know what to do. If you're bit or someone's bit with you, keep them calm as possible and get back to the car and get yourself to the hospital as quick as you can without overexerting yourself. Do not apply a tourniquet. The tourniquets, um, this has changed over like the last five years. But the, you know, right now tourniquets basically, if you were to get bit in the hand and you tie a tourniquet on your arm, it's basically slowing that venom down in this area and it allows it to work more in this area. It's causing more damage in this area. You've been bit, it's in your blood, get to the hospital, let the doctors start giving the antivenom and let them do it. They're the experts. Cold presses will irritate a lot of times uh, for the people, um, including the gentleman that got bit in the foot. He said when he applied ice within like three minutes, it was excruciating. It went from hardly anything to it was so painful, uh, which is why I think he ended up going to the hospital because he was in so much pain. Do not cut the bite with a knife um, and do not try to suck the venom out because it doesn't work, uh, only in the movies. <laughs> but if you have a cut in your mouth and you get venom in your mouth, then you've been venomated yourself twice. Mm. So just don't do that. Right? And do not take any medication. Just drink some water and get yourself to the hospital as quick as you can without overturning yourself. All right, quick true false. All right, snakes often chase people. False. All right. You guys can anticipate if you like. <laughs> All snake species bite. Yeah. Yep. True. True. Or can. Uh, Virginia snakes are considered poisonous. Yeah. All Virginia snakes eat rodents. Yeah. Snakes often dig their own holes to build nests. Yeah. They don't dig. They're, they're not going to do that. They're going to find somebody else's hole they dug, and they don't lay nests. <laughs> if I find a snake shed on my property, I have a snake problem? Yeah. Well, not necessarily. Could be passing through. Rat snakes are notorious for coming through, shedding, leaving you a gift, and then moving on. So if you get them in your house, they do that. Um, let's see, all Virginia snakes lay eggs. Also, snakes can live up to over up to and over 20 years. And I only put that in there because for anyone that has kids that are looking to buy a snake, guess who's going to be taking care of them when they go to college? It's going to be your pets, and then you're going to call me and say, "I need to rehome this." I have a retirement home for snakes that people went away to school and their mom yeah. said, here you go. Great. That's <laughs> right. Four of them. Hopefully it allows them to take it with them. Right. So, uh, if bit by a venomous snake, you should apply a tourniquet. Oh, no. And is it is it illegal to kill snakes in the state of Virginia? It yeah. is illegal to kill any snake in the state of Virginia unless that snake is causing harm to you. Now, I'll give you my opinion because there's a lot of opinions out there. I'm out uh, going out to the barn to work, to work with my horse, 
I've noticed about 20 feet to the right of me, there's a copperhead or a timber curled up underneath a tree. I walk out of my way to go kill that snake. That's it. I'm in my barn, I'm in the stall. I turn and there's a timber rattlesnake curled up rattling and trying to eat me, right? It's gonna bite my dog, maybe my kids in there helping me. And you kill that snake because you wanna defend yourself to ensure you can get out of the barn without getting bit. And that's probably okay. Not that timbers do that, but people seem to think sometimes they do. And that is it. All right. This is the signal. <laughs> if you do not want to be around snakes to go to the back of the room or not, I'm going to take out uh, the rat snake first. Uh, if you guys want to come up and pet, hold, etc., you can take pictures if you want to. I'm happy to hang out and answer questions. You if, <laughs> if you did do the survey when you got here, if you're able to do this post survey, this is shorter than the first one. Um, I'll pass these 